the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast, hosted by 360 Energy. Henning Gloystein is Director for Energy, Climate and Natural Resources at Eurasia Group based in London. He covers geopolitical risk in oil and natural gas supplies, the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, as well as green industrial trends. Prior to returning to London in 2021, Henning was based in Singapore for seven years, covering the rise of Asia to become the world's biggest consuming region of natural resources. Henning started his career in energy analysis at Commodity Pricing Agency Platts in 2007, where he was responsible for pricing European wholesale power, natural gas, coal, and carbon markets. Henning has a dual master's degree in history, politics, and science and technology from Humboldt and Technical University in Berlin. Now let's get into the episode with Henning. Welcome back, Dave and John. Good to be back. Yes, it's great to be back, Lysander. And again, I'm looking forward to this podcast with our special guest. On today's episode, we have our guest, Henning Gloystein, Director of Energy and Natural Resources at Eurasia Group. Welcome, Henning. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Henning, I'm so pleased to have you. John, is, as you know, is based in the UK. It has some exposure. And he'll look at the energy lens in an in a engineering piece. But I'm really interested, that, like we know there's two pieces to energy. It's actually consumption and pricing. So I believe you have a lot of knowledge in market, market pricing and what's going on. And I also believe that what happens in Europe has a tremendous impact here in North America. I don't think many people in North America can appreciate that. So having you here and talking about what's going on in Europe is, is going to, I think, give a lot of insight on what could happen here in North America as we go forward. So thank you for being here. I'll start with the first question, let's say, and that is, what is Europe's current and future position on energy as you see it, specifically on the supply side? And energy pricing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest policy and market issues in Europe right now and has been for the last year and will continue to be so for the next year because on the supply side, the, Europe has lost the biggest supplier of what are still the most important fuels, oil, natural gas, and coal. Within a single year with Russia, Europe has had to cope without virtually any of this coming from Russia anymore. So there is still a little bit of Russian oil in, in Europe's systems, a little bit of coal and a teeny bit of natural gas. But the supply cut is give or take 90%. And that is on this scale, I don't think ever happened before that, that one of the biggest consumer regions in the world loses its single biggest supplier all in one go. Now, when the war started, when Russia's invasion of Ukraine started almost exactly a year ago, barely anyone thought this was going to be possible, that Europe could either voluntarily wean, it, wean itself off Russian fossil fuels or could cope if Russia cut Europe off fossil fuels. A year later, we know it's happened. It's, it's cost Europe an arm and a leg in the form of hundreds of billions of dollars, but it's worked. It's now pretty much out of the system. We're coming out of the winter, the first winter where this has been the case. And winters is where it matters because that's where heating consumption of natural gas and of oil boilers is highest. And winter's almost over. It's been relatively mild, but not super mild. And we came out of this without energy shortages, without blackouts. In fact, it now looks as though the EU and maybe even the UK might avoid a recession. So it's, it's a remarkable achievement. Now, I mentioned the price. It's, you know, cost watering in terms of money. We saw, especially late last summer, power and natural gas prices in Europe literally went through the roof. Now, had that lasted for more than just a couple of weeks, that would have been ruinous for Europe's industry and households. That would have caused the blackouts and the industrial derailment that people were fearing. Luckily, we've come out of this winter and the prices have come up by 80, 90 percent. And we are now facing a 2023 a rest of the year where the situation in terms of pricing is not any more like being punched in the face, but having a bit of a headache. So the, the wholesale natural gas and power price is probably about two to three times as high as it was on average in the previous decade prior to this crisis, but they're not at levels where companies go out of business anymore, which is great news. But the bad news is, and so before I sound too optimistic here, is the outlook for this year and probably next is that 
structurally, energy prices will remain higher than they were prior to this crisis because the operational costs to import fossil fuel from anywhere but Russia will remain fairly high. We have to buy this as Europeans in a global market competing with Asia, competing with, with globally for those fuels, and that will have some price pressure. If it gets cold next winter, there could be spikes. If there's unplanned outages, let's say North American LNG outages, could be a price spike. So it's a tight margin. And on top of that, all the European energy sector is facing huge capex costs, so capital expenditure. They have to finance all these regasification terminals to get new LNG in from alternative sources so that it's not Russian. They have to build new offshore wind farms, interconnectors, and so forth. That's costing hundreds of billions, or going to cost them another hundreds of billions of dollars over the next couple of years. And that means that even if the wholesale price of fossil fuels goes down, utilities are really reluctant to pass this on to you and me as households or to industry as well, because their capex costs are so high. So, and this will be a headache at least for another year or so. From the middle of the decade, I think we might be facing a fairly strong deflationary energy price environment in Europe because of all these investment into efficiency, into new sources, uh, renewable sources, but also new fossil fuel sources, especially on the LNG side will come in. But that's still almost two years from now. So it's the panic of last year is probably over, but this year is not going to be exactly fun yet. But it's remarkable that we've come out of it without blackouts or a serious industrial crisis. It, it is remarkable. And let me just say to you, or ask you, when you said they, you know, in the next two years, the pricing will be higher. If, if Let's use natural gas as a benchmark. What, what do you, you have any forecasting that you have for natural gas pricing in, in the next year or two for, for Europe? What you're looking at? Putting me on the hot chair here. Uh, Price forecasting. Yeah. We're never good at it anyway. And at the moment, no, no. Up. And I want to make sure everyone knows that, but it's just a forecast. And I no, no, no. It. It's all right. Okay. I'll give it a shot. So if we talk about dollars per MMBTU, so I would say the average for the next year or three, so until about 2025, will be about between 15 and 25 dollars per MMBTU, which is, if you think about last year, is a bargain. We saw $75 per MBTU, but if you think about before, before the crisis, you know, we saw LNG prices at $2 per MBTU just before COVID hit and then the three or four before then. So you have to go back to Fukushima in 2011 to see prices this high. And so for our North American listeners, effectively, we're currently paying about $3 per MMBTU. Now, are you talking commodity or that would be deemed as burner tip? Like, I just would need to make sure. Is that a full pricing or just commodity? So this would be for wholesale prices of natural gas. Indeed. Okay. So indeed, Henry Hub in the U.S. is currently priced to slightly under $3 per MMBTU. And I would expect your prices to be between 15 and $25 per MMBTU on average over the next two years or so which is a good indication of that it's still pretty expensive. Yes. And as you said, and we're going to get into it, it's going to drive your market to be doing things that they wouldn't have done, hence because of it. Yeah, indeed. So when, when prices in any commodity go this high, the sort of stuff in normal times that doesn't make much sense suddenly happens. You can yes. send the commodity from one place to another around the world and back again, which it shouldn't, or you can start drilling in places where you probably shouldn't be drilling in the normal circumstances, which is exactly what we're seeing. There are oil and gas producers around the world. They're looking at the European situation saying, wow, this is a fantastic business opportunity. We must drill now more and sell to Europeans. And this is going to delay the green transition. For sure, there is a small window of opportunity here, but Longer term, I think a lot of people overlook here that the Europeans are throwing even more money at accelerating the deep green transition in order to avoid future price shocks like this. So the Europe's oil and gas window of opportunity is pretty, pretty small and it is narrowing fast. Right. Okay. I had a question that you've answered partly. So I'm going to change what that question is. And you have talked about the impact of, of the Ukraine war on Europe. The dimension I want to, to bring into this, and I don't know if you can comment on it, certainly in the UK, we've had, should we say, government intervention to soften the impact on consumers. For example, payments to retail consumers and also to commercial users. But that, that's going to stop April, they're stopping those payments. I wonder if you could just talk about the, the impact of what 
governments have been trying to do in in mechanisms like that and what what it what it, what it has meant in the overall picture yeah that's that's a really good point john so the short answer to this is that every government across europe in the eu or next to it has done pretty much everything it can and tried to find any solution to, to ease the pain that has included as in the UK so far, whether you just mentioned in April, this will stop a cap on retail prices. It has included direct payments to small to medium sized industries. It has in included VAT tax freezes to, to compensate for rising electricity bills. It's included co gas contributions to your gas consumption at home in Germany, for instance. So any tool as a of government you can think of to support the public and especially small to mid sized industries has been used. And this is a bit of a, I mean, I, I understandably so. The, the price drop last year was so high that you had to support absolutely everybody. And this is how big the problem was. Had you not supported consumers, and I mean by that households and small to mid-sized industry, they would have gone, the households would have defaulted to the utilities, driving them into financial trouble. Industries would have gone out of business and then unemployment surges. So governments had to support everybody and its costs. Actually, there's a very good example. The German government, it's, it's the EU's biggest economy. They allocated 200 billion euros to this for a single year in support. And they're going to probably allocate something like that next year as well. Probably a bit less, but something in that ballpark, which gives you an idea. That's one of 27 members. Okay, it's the biggest one, but it probably gives you an idea that between 2022 and 2024, the EU will have spent up and around a trillion dollars worth of energy support all in, which of course comes two years after COVID support, which was that high again. And this is a fiscal problem. This won't be able to go on forever. And this is why at some point they're going to have to do something. You mentioned in the UK, they're already dialing back support for consumers as of April, which will hurt. But this sort of pressure will happen everywhere, even in the most fiscally thrift countries, for instance, the Germans, they're going to have to dial this back at some point. Did you think with this, I've often thought I've been in energy business for a long time. And there's the Benjamin Franklin statement of you don't appreciate the value of water until the well runs dry. And I think there's been a, been a situation with this that people have taken, you know, good, well, reasonably priced energy supplies as just a, you know, it's there. And I think, I think, did you think this is sort of, I, I wonder what long-term lessons we're going to learn from this, I think is where I'm going. Yeah, we had a really good point. I mean, the concept even I grew up, thinking you switch on the light and that's what happens. The light goes on and it always goes on and it doesn't, and it doesn't feel particularly expensive. I mean, as a kid, I never had to pay the bill, but yeah, I mean, that suddenly last year was, I think the first time that give or take half a billion people in a very wealthy area of the world thought that there might be cold in winter because there might be blackouts or the heatings won't work anymore. Yeah. And that is a concept that is new. And it's also, by the way, a concept that wealthy industrialized areas can't have for long because otherwise they won't remain wealthy and industrialized for very long. So it, I think a lot of people have woken up to the fact that, it, that energy is a commodity. It is a scarce good in some ways. Not in always, of course, they are renewables. But, and governments, and this is probably the, almost the more important part, have realized that they can't take affordable, reliable energy for granted in their infrastructure forever. And I think a lot of realism has crept into governments recently with governments that were ideologically stuck to one form or the other a little bit too, too closely have now realized mm, we need to, to also ensure security and affordability while preparing for climate change. And this is amazing. I mean, this is so complicated. Every single challenge here is difficult. It was incredibly difficult securing this winter's energy supply for Europe. It's incredibly difficult to do it for next winter as well. And then to keep on track for climate change and the, the decarbonization that we will have to engage in all at the same time. Yes, it's interesting on that because in the UK, we've had our, one of our major, well, trade department has been broken up into separate departments now. And we have a separate government minister responsible for net zero and energy security. And the two have been put together. And that is going to prove particularly interesting, I think, as we go forward. Very, very much so, yeah. Oddly, I mean, it seems a return to the past, no? I mean, I seem to remember yes. Dick. That's right. I'm a change. So I, yes. I actually did say I think that was probably a necessary switch back to something, because back then, it seemed, if I remember correctly, Dick, Dick was broken up for no good reason, as far as I can see. So, yes, I, I, I mean, we, 
we, we have messed around. I don't know if North America has been, I think, more consistent in this, but certainly in the UK, we've messed around with where energy fits. I think historically part of that, and this is how governments are involved, isn't it? Part of that was because so much of our utilities were government owned. So they dealt with them in a completely different way. And there's how, as a government, do you deal with free market utilities? It's yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, you know, both of you are talking with this European mindset and here yes. in North America, we, again, I think it's great for our listeners because I think what you're ex being exposed to is something that I don't think many people in North America have been exposed to, like security of energy supply. We've always had an abundance. No one's yep. ever worried about access to energy and pricing. Yes, there has been pricing shocks, but not, not to the degree that you're talking about. And I think with this energy transition that is going to happen, whether people accept it or agree that it's going to happen, it will. And because of that, there'll be some challenges that will be faced for sure. So I do want to make sure people understand when, when we're talking about this, how it will relate here in North America. I want to come back depending on the on the markets place and that how did how did Europe compensate for the lack of energy supply? I know you talked about it a bit, but could you go into you know all of a sudden you know you have this major disruption? By the way, I didn't know it was coal as well. I thought it was natural gas and oil, but it coal. How did what did they do? How did and how did it happen so quickly? When I heard an LNG port was developed in eight months, when we talk about three to five years, I go, oh my gosh, the speed of what was done. Unbelievable. So can you share with our audience? Yeah. So yeah, the, this is, I mean, the way you just also mentioned, like, wow, it's not just gas, it was also coal and oil. Sure, but natural gas was the hardest one. That, so that's why it caught all the attention because Europe had spent 40 years building a pipeline network from Russia to Europe, and that, that had to be dealt away with. And then half of, some of it got blown up as well with Nord Stream 1 and 2. So how this happened is, is quite remarkable. There has actually been a little bit of a precedence here. So there, outside of Europe, there's been one country that has had to deal with something similar, and that is Japan and Fukushima in 2011. And I mention this because when, especially Germany's industry, realized about exactly a year ago, that there might be a chance that they'd be cut off of their biggest gas supply, or, but in general fossil fuel supply, they started looking around for precedents and they called, they called Japan because the Japanese government and the EU and Germany in particular are very close industrial ties. And so the blueprint for this was Japan when after the earthquake, tsunami and nuclear meltdowns in 2011, Japan had to switch off its entire 35 or so nuclear reactors overnight and deal with it. They dealt with that. They dealt it without power outages, without a real recession. And so people figured, ah, maybe we can learn something here. And so that is basically what it, around March, April last year happened. And then you have to transfer it. Japan isn't the EU. The EU is much bigger. But also that means that there are other solutions available that Japan didn't. So for starters, it, the first thing that ha needed to happen was consumption of natural gas had to go down fast. And immediately, class immediately, I said, it has to go down immediately and by quite a lot. Now, we started at Eurasia Group in April the last year, hearing industry saying, we think we might have to live without Russian gas by the winter of 2022, 2023, which was when the European Commission was still saying that they would phase out Russian natural gas by 2027. So when we published kind of a summary of what we thought the industry was planning to do, we were laughed at and shouted at in, in equal amount, which is now what's happened. Demand went down. The European industry, so the, the chemical makers, the cement makers, the steel makers, basically they looked at every component that uses a natural gas as a feedstock and said, how old is this one? And if, it, if the answer was 30 years old or something like that, they said, well, what if we take it out and put in a new, a new version of the same thing? How much less gas does it consume? The answer is normally about 30% less. So they realized, whoa. If we can just modernize all our old stuff within the next year, we are going to save a lot of energy by not actually losing output, which is exactly what they did. They, they, they threw money at the problem, and especially big industry had a lot of cash and government support for them to just modernize all the old stuff. And then they, the, st the old stuff that they couldn't modernize, let's say really old pipes that are long, you could coat. So thermal coating happened. So a lot of, especially the chemical industry, looked at 
it's old big pipes and said, well, what if I put a slow more coat around it? What happens then? And the, the result is a 10% loss improvement in efficiency because your thermal loss is reduced, like putting on a coat aside. So this is what industry did immediately. And this is the sort of stuff that will never come back. Once companies, the big industries realize that, wow, we can consume 30% less gas by producing the same amount of stuff. That's an efficiency gain you will never do get back. And this will continue this year. The other aspect has been just trying to become a more, bit more savvy about consumption in offices, reducing the thermostat from, let's say, 22 degrees centigrade to 16, and people putting on pullovers at home. Some of this will come back because it's like 16 degrees. We did this in the office in winter is actually quite cold when you're sitting down. 22 degrees is probably a bit too warm. 19 is probably fine. So, uh, and then a little bit has been import substitution so that you, instead of uh, making base chemicals, for instance, yourself, you import it from China or the United States. And a couple of companies went out of business. And that part is the part that hit industry and growth so far. But it's been quite low because I mentioned earlier, it looks like the EU will, will avoid recession, UK maybe as well. And actually, if you look at industrial output, year on year, 2022, it was flat with 2021, although the gas consumption was down by more than 20%. So this is a remarkable achievement, but uh, I said before, it, it costs hundreds of billions of euros. But that is why this is moving from an emergency management to long-term planning, because once you've spent so much money on efficiency gains, you really don't want to just blow it all away and start consuming again. This is this, And again, a precedence is Japan. Japan's industry never went back to consume as much energy as it did prior to Fukushima, although its industry as a whole has, has gone back and is actually now bigger than it was 12 years ago. So it's, it's a remarkable success story, I'd actually say, by industry, helped, of course, by lots of government money and households being, being, being conscious of their consumption. So what I'm hearing, and it's something that we really try to inform the public, is it is efficiency, conservation, and supply options. You can't look at managing energy slash carbon without looking at both those in combination. And, and unfortunately, at least in North America, we find that they tend to be worked in silos and not integrated. But you had to in Europe win that situation, right? Yeah, I mean, emergency makes you creative. That's, you know, if you have to do something... You do it, even if you thought it was impossible before. I mean, on the supply side, of course, I don't want to only lord and hill being consumers here. The energy industry, I know they're getting shouted at for all their excessive profits now, and they, they do look a bit excessive. But I mean, the, the internationally the energy industry, gas producers, especially the energy industry, but also pipeline operates from Norway, have done a remarkable job. So LNG exports from the US to, to Europe exploded. The, the biggest buyer of LNG in the world in 2022 was France. And prior to that, it, it, it had been China, Japan, South Korea, whatever, uh, not in Europe. And the French didn't supply that gas to themselves because the French don't actually consume a lot of gas. They could, they pumped it on. They built a new pipeline really fast from the LNG import terminals in the North Sea at Dunkirk to Germany, who needed the gas because the Germans didn't have LNG import terminals. It took them some time. Dave, you mentioned it earlier. The Dutch actually built two terminals within five months last year. Germans built three terminals within eight months. So there's now half a dozen new terminals. But at the start of this, they were there. The French, though, had their own little problem. They have an electricity problem because half their nuclear power stations, the power plant fleet was, was offline for most of last year. And they use electricity for heating in winter. So the French needed more electricity. The Germans needed more gas. So what happened is cooperation. It wasn't shouted about and made very public. The French imported more LNG. They built a little pipeline for the Germans to pump the gas to Germany so that the Germans could use that gas to generate more electricity so that the Germans could heat themselves and send some of that electricity right back to France where it was needed. By cooperation between Paris, Berlin, the grid operators, the LNG folks. Meanwhile, Norway is now the biggest gas supply to, to Europe. They've replaced Russia. Norway, I mean, it's also remarkable what they did. The Norwegian government deferred all non-essential maintenance of their offshore oil gas rigs this winter so that they could produce more than nameplate capacity through winter. Yes, they, they earned a fortune doing it, but it's remarkable. They had to change law for this. They had to ask their workers to do stuff that normally under normal regulatory environments looks a bit shaky. So that's worked. The energy industry has, to, has done remarkable stuff here to, to meet that demand because amazingly, European gas imports, as we speak now, are only 8% lower than they were at the start of the war when Russia was fully supplying still. Wow, so, that's amazing. 
It is, yeah. Hence, the inventory is actually quite full coming out of winter because that plus reduction in consumption means that we've actually had surplus gas supply. That's fantastic. I, I want to, I, I, we do a lot of work in the greenhouse industry. And so I met with a couple of folks from the Netherlands last week. And they echoed what you said. They said, listen, we've, we reduced our consumption by 30, 20 to 30%. And these guys were really efficient before. And they go, we're not going back. We, we don't have to go back. We, we know now that we can do this. Now I have to tell you, like, if I said that to anyone in North America, they, like, they look sideways at me, like, what the heck are you talking about? That's a, but the Dutch would be, you would appreciate this too, Henning. They're really efficient to start with. And then they did 30% on top of that. It's. It's amazing, really. I, I actually, if you want to see sort of how to deal with this live and in long term, the best policies, industrial scale, like how industry adopts in the fertilizer industry, the greenhouse gas industry, the chemical industry, and how governments adopted this is actually the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, uh, and I don't say I, I'm neither Belgian nor Dutch, and I, I don't work for their governments, but they are the ones, I mean, they've got the big industrial hubs, Rotterdam and Antwerp got the, the greenhouses you mentioned to agriculture, which are electricity intensive and ammonia intensive because of fertilizers. They have very few natural resources and they resolve this really well. And so, and if you want to see live how they're adapting to the future, I really recommend anyone who has the time to go to, especially Antwerp at the moment, because it's a, it's a chemical renewable industrial cluster all at once. And all these long-term plans are being put into motion physically already. You can actually see what it, what's going to happen in the next 30 years. It's gone from PowerPoint to drilling. It's quite remarkable. I'd like to take us back to looking at the, the bit of the gap that's filled with, with the loss of Russian energy, should we call it. And simplistically, you would think this could, could present a wonderful opportunity for renewable energy. Has it? Yes-ish. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or the Germans say Jain, which is Ja and Nein at the same time. Yes. So two steps ahead, one step back, I and mean, lots of stuff like this going on. Basically, I, I think, yes, in the long term, definitely. Every single EU member, plus the UK, plus Switzerland, so all, and all its neighbors uh, have now said they will use this crisis, that they will use this energy crisis to accelerate the green transition. It looks different in every single country, even within some countries it looks different by region, but the outcome, the direction is green and the color. Because, and I think this is actually one of the main messages here, if you, and it's a political and economic message, and actually security of supply, so it's a national security. If you take the concept of high, unaffordably high fossil fuel prices, plus very low reliability, and that's what we've, experienced last year. The biggest disruption of fossil fuel supply and the biggest explosion in prices on record of that supply, that tells you politically, both security-wise and economically, to invest into low-carbon local energy supply. It, it is, it's really hard to maneuver around that argument, even if you didn't have a carbon price or subsidies, whatever. And it's, that is the, 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 the big thing in, in that is the, basically the message. However, in the short term, there has been this emergency that we could, you know, we had to avoid winter shortages. Europe, for the first time in 15 years, had to raise its coal imports. Coal-fired power generation has gone up significantly, although it's actually now coming down already again. But no matter what, the, the Germany fired up like 15 new old coal-fired power stations. It even approved another lignite mine last one, which is remarkable, given that there's a Green Party involved in the government. The French, Italians, and Dutch did similar stuff. And these coal units won't all be switched off this year. They will be operating for another two to three years until what I mentioned earlier, until probably around 2025, the, the situation totally eases and normalizes again. And that is what I mean, sort of long-term, the green transition will accelerate. The money being spent is largely green. The policy environment, the regulatory environment, is, it, it's all green. But the emergency management that we're still dealing with right now is, is brown, black, and fossil. Very nice. That, that being said, do you, do you think, Henning, that you know, the war ends, will, will Europe ever go back to Russian gas, do you think? Or is that a lesson learned there? Yeah. So, I mean, in the long, long term, let's face it, we have to cooperate and trade with Europe's biggest 
neighbor. Russia is yeah. Europe's neighbor. It, it is. It has every natural resource of the world that you need now and you will need in future. And trade does enable peace. I, I know that's fallen to pieces recently. You know, 40 years of pipeline politics in Germany just fell to pieces. And they overdid it with this. Like, but, I mean, you know, I, I am half German, we, and we shouldn't totally forget that after World War II, after Germany laid waste to most of Europe and, and beyond, two, three years later, Western Germany was being fully integrated again. And, and that's, you know, it's, I think in times of war, it's something to, to recognize. That said, Germany, well, also Germany, but Europe will not ever again import as much fossil fuels ever from Russia again for two reasons. First of all, the green transition will accelerate and it's being pushed forward, as I said. Second of all, all the deals that have just been made, American LNG pipeline from Norway stuff, for the hydrogen alliances that are being made, Algeria deals, Azerbaijan, Israeli gas and oil coming, these are all 15 to 20 year agreements. So that means even if peace broke out next week and Mr. Navalny is released from jail and becomes Russian president, the, we can't return, even if we wanted to. It's, it's gone. And the trust, of course, is gone for another probably 10 years. So what that means is that if or when there is some form of a credible ceasefire or peace, there, I think there will be some Russian natural gas coming back to Europe, but, but only via Ukraine, so that Ukraine gets the transit payments from Russia, and that serves the parts of the EU that are landlocked, Czechia, Slovakia, Hungary, Austria, and so southeastern Germany, Bavaria, where you can't build offshore wind farms and LNG terminals. And, but it will be nowhere near as big as it used to be. And Nord Stream, for that matter, and I know this from the German officials, Nord Stream 1 is gone for good. It's ruptured on more than 10 kilometers. It's fully corroded, full of water. It's, it's broken. Nord Stream 2, the f one pipeline is totally broken, and the second half of Nord Stream 2 could one day be brought back. But that would require an immense rebuilding of trust between Russia, Germany, and the EU as a whole. I mean, imagine the stink that there was, or remember the stink there was when the Germans wanted to approve Nord Stream 2, even when there was no war. This, so the, the short answer is Europe will, will never again import as much fossil fuels, and in particular natural gas from Russia, as they used to. Coal is probably gone forever. Natural gas, maybe something will come back. Oil is the one that might come back, because it does make sense for Russian oil from the Black Sea to go through the Black Sea and then say to Italy, rather than then go through the Suez Canal and through the Indian Ocean to India, maybe even more beyond. So that might happen. But on the natural gas side, I think the horses have left us stable, I think, in short list. Right. You've talked about how pivotal, in a way, LNG was to coping with this problem. And I think you alluded to the fact that this happened because it became economically viable. I think the question I've got is, how sensitive is the LNG market to, to price in terms of how far move with it? Yeah, good point. I mean, it's very sensitive. No? I mean, so in, in Europe, LNG was the immediate solution because it's faster getting it to Europe than building pipelines from anywhere else. And so that, you know, it's, it's the only alternative that moved fast enough. Literally, how fast can we get a ship here to the existing import terminals? And how fast can, can we get floating regasification terminals here and start the operating them. And the answer is, that, well, over the last year, sufficient if you throw as much money as is required to it. And this is a key message here. So especially the German and the Dutch governments, they last year, and this continues into this year, have said price is secondary to security supply. It does not matter how expensive natural gas is, i.e. LNG. We need to get a secure supply because if we have a shortage, and we have industrial outages, and I mean literally industrial outages. The companies like BSS, they have to shut down these huge chemical plants. If they run out of gas, they, the loss in pressure actually does damage to infrastructure. So it's not just an, in a recession by having to shut down for a few weeks. It, it actually does physical damage to the economic backbone. And that had to be avoided. So they, the, you know, the wealthy governments threw money at this and uh, just said, okay, it doesn't matter how much it costs, we'll just buy it. And that, of course, made LNG so expensive for the rest of the world that even mighty China's thought, goodness me, let's, let's take a breather on this one. And, and more brutally in South and Southeast Asia, in particular Pakistan, it caused blackouts and energy shortages because they were literally priced out of the market. They saw the gas price and said, we can't afford that. And the light went off in parts of Pakistan and on a major scale. That's the brutal reality, what Europe's just 
threw money at this. And this is the price sensitivity. And the Europeans, if, if it gets cold next winter, they're going to do it again. But long term, of course, this is, this is actually not good to the LNG industry because, yes, they've proven that they can react to an emergency and send cargo to where they need it if the price is right. But in the longer term, if you are in an emerging market, let's say you're in Vietnam or in, in the Philippines or Thailand, and the LNG industry comes up to you and says, we're a really flexible industry. And then you say, but we here in the tropics really don't like it when there's a war going on in Europe or when it gets cold in China and we get priced out of the market and we can't afford this stuff anymore. This is, this is a crazy price. It, I mean, in, in Henry Hub prices, I, I remember in the eight years that I lived in Southeast Asia, the industries of Thailand, Vietnam, and Philippines, so the manufacturing hubs in that area, they, they say they can't really live with prices above $7 per MBTU. It doesn't work. Their industry, like the power price is just too high. They're, they're not competitive. I think last year we had 75. So amazingly, the energy industry is the most volatile in the world, and that has ensured supply in, in an emergency. But that volatility at the same time causes, really scares off future developers, especially emerging markets, because they look at this and say, this is crazy, we can't do this. Yeah, I think that speaks to the complexity of energy markets. It's very easy, you know, to do your economics 101, supply and demand, how does that work? But then the nuances of what happens and the technologies and policies and I think it speaks to the point, Dave made a comment earlier, sort of health warning around costs. I know all, over all the years I've been involved in energy, I've never yet seen an energy forecaster be able to come up with a, a meaningful long-term forecast. And it's because there are just too many variables. I, I totally agree. And that's why my forecast for gas prices for the next year is basically between one and 100. And even that <laughs> might be wrong. <laughs> that's because it's good in the 20s. <laughs> That works. Henning, this has been an excellent episode on the European energy market. What is the biggest takeaway for our listeners? Really good question. So the, the biggest one I would say from a European point of view, reason I sit in Europe, is it is absolutely amazing what the, the pace and scale of change that is possible if you have to. And, and if you look at the solutions that are there in the long term, they all point towards the need, but also the opportunities provided by clean, by low zero carbon energy solutions. This, this is the long-term solution. Sure, in the short term, we, we need anything we can get our fingers on. But in the long term, as I mentioned before, is if, if you have a high risk of supply disruption and, and exploding prices of the fossil fuel, then the solution is to invest into the local technologies that you can generate locally by creating jobs and cheap, abundant energy and we can do it we just need to see the opportunity here rather than just the risk and the danger thanks for that heading john what's your biggest takeaway i i think it's something that i i've always thought that what we're dealing with within energy if you want to just deal with it in within your own country and close off your mind to what else is going on you're making a big big mistake you know we are so globally interconnected in every way now that, you know, something that happens in one country at some point has an impact on another. Thanks for that, John. Dave, with your North American perspective, what was your biggest takeaway? Well, I, I'm going to restate what I said at the beginning, and that is, I think we're going to have to look at our European neighbors who are well advanced, maybe unfortunately because they were, they had to, but they'll be doing things and have are doing things that we haven't even considered. And I think in this carbon transition that's going to be required and is required, there's going to be a lot to be learned. And I think the last thing I'll say is I think the Europeans are actually going to make things more cost-effective because they're doing stuff that are bleeding edge that now will start becoming the norm going forward. I think it will start driving prices to get as these new products get into the marketplace. So that's, that's basically what I've heard. And the last thing I want to say I think the thought that the amount of energy, did I get that right? Is there 8% that you're importing or using 8% less energy, but the production is, is about the same in 2021? Is that, did I get that correct? No, quite, man. Uh, so it's even more dramatic. So <laughs> industrial output in 2022 was flat versus 2021. So we just avoided an industrial recession, but the industrial goods you're produced was the same, but industrial gas consumption was 20% lower. Year on year. Oh, 20% lower. Now, the 8% where that came from is gas 
supply to Europe. So European gas imports, as okay. we speak now, are only 8% below what they were at the start of the Russian invasion. So even with the loss of ma more than 90% of Russian uh, gas, Europe has actually only lost about 8% of supply. And if you then consider that actually they can consume 20% less, that's how Europe managed to build its inventories to get through winter. Very good. All right, Dave, John, Henning, thank you for your time this week. It's been really good. You'll enjoy it. Thank you, Henning. Thank you so much. Thanks. That's all for today's episode of the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check us out on our website at 360energy.net and follow us on LinkedIn at 360 Energy Inc. Tune in to our podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Anchor, or other listening platforms by searching the 360 on Energy and Carbon. You can watch the video recording and subscribe on YouTube at 360 Energy Inc. Email us your feedback at podcast at 360energy.net or comment on our LinkedIn posts. See you next week.